Hello, Virtual ICFP. I hope you're all having a wonderful conference so far. I am Mitchell Picard. This is joint work with Graham Hutton. We're from the Functional Programming Lab at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And we're going to be showing you how to calculate a dependently typed compiler. Why would you want to calculate a dependently typed compiler? Well, compilers can go wrong. We all know that. It's not necessarily a very common occurrence, but we all enjoy formally verifying stuff. Uh, so it'd be nice to have completely formally verified compilers that we know cannot go wrong. Previous work by Hutton and Barr showed a alternative way of formally verifying a compiler. It doesn't... Rather than writing a compiler and then formally verifying it, they show how to derive a compiler from the specification. So given a language specification, you can go through a calculation process, you get a compiler out of the other side, and then you also get a proof uh, of the formal verification of the compiler for free. But their approach so far only deals with untyped languages. We want to show how to extend that approach to typed source and target languages. Uh, our approach is based on the use of dependent types and is completely formalized in Agda. Whereas the previous work is done in Haskell, the use of dependent types allows us to make sure that everything is completely type safe. So the compiler and the abstract machine are all type safe, which makes the resulting calculations a lot easier to mechanically check. So we're going to begin with a simple expression of natural numbers and booleans. Uh, you've all seen similar things before, I'm sure. It's just a very basic um, expression type where we have natural numbers and booleans. You can add natural numbers together and do if statements on booleans. The problem with this is that you can construct illegal, illegal terms, such as trying to add true and five. Obviously, a standard way of fixing this would be to write a type checker. But when we want to do calculations on these, it turns out to be easier to um, encode the typing information in the data type itself. So we're going to use an intrinsically typed representation in Agda. So this is where the dependent types come in. Uh, if you're not familiar with dependent types, this is where we index this expression um, by the type of the term it represents. So instead of just exp expression, it would be exp of bool or nat, for example. Um, so the constructor for values gets collapsed into just one constructor. So whatever value this is, whether it's a nat or a bool, uh, it can go through this constructor, and we will get an exp nat or an exp bool out of the other side. Add here specifies that we're not just taking expressions, we're taking expressions of natural numbers every time. So we take two natural number expressions in and return a natural number expression out. Uh, if takes a bool expression in, and uh, that is the condition that we're going to work on, and it takes a true branch and a false branch, which must both be the same type, and then the return type is the same type as the branches. Um, and this stops illegal terms type checking. You can't add together true and five now, for example, because this add has to take two natural number terms. And then we can write a simple evaluation function, which is going to be the specification of our language. This is how the language behaves. And we just take the exp of t, whatever type this is, and return a basic agda type of t. So a value just gets collapsed into the value that's inside. An addition now, because we specified previously from the type of add that the two expressions have to be natural numbers expressions, once we evaluate this recursively, we know this is going to be a natural number. So we can add together these two natural numbers to get a natural number out the other side. And it's exactly the same thing with if, because we have that proof of the types before, we can plug it straight into Agda's if then else function, and it will all just work. Our compilation target is going to be a stack-based abstract machine, but we want it to be completely well-typed. So we use dependent types to keep track of the type of all the elements on the stack and what order they're in. So our stack data type is again indexed, this time by a list of types. This list will tell us the order and the type of all the elements on the stack. And now we construct this recursively just by starting with an empty stack. 
and then an operator to push new elements onto the stack, which just updates this list by pushing the new type onto the head of the list. For example, the stack five on top of true on top of the empty stack, so that's just the stack with five and true on it, uh, would have the type stack, and then a list of the natural number and boolean, uh, corresponding to the five and the true. So if we tried to construct this a stack of this type with true here instead of five, this would fail the type checker. So it knows at compile time what the type of all the elements is. The code type is similar. It is indexed, but this time it's indexed over two lists of types. The first list is going to be the type of the input stack. The second list is going to be the type of the output stack because code will take an input stack, operate on the stack, and then return a new stack. So for example, some code to represent addition would have a type something like this. Um, the first stack would have two natural numbers on the top, and the return stack would have one natural number, the two numbers added together. And then, because of this quantifier, we know that the rest of the stack is left unchanged. It, it can't change the rest of the stack. And now our compiler uh, will take our expression type from before and convert it into some code. And the code simply takes a stack and pushes a new value on top of the stack, which is the value of this expression. Uh, and execution simply takes some code and then, as you'd expect, takes the input stack, which corresponds to the input stack type here, and returns an output stack corresponding to the output stack type. Now, how do we know that the compiler we generate at the other end is going to be correct? So intuitively, we know that compiling an expression and then executing it will, should give you exactly the same result as just evaluating the expression directly using the evaluation function from before. And we can capture this in an actual compiler correctness condition. Um, so this just formalizes what we've written above. So for some expression E, if we compile it and then execute it on some stack S, that is the same as evaluating it directly and then just pushing it onto the stack. Now, how are we actually going to do the calculation? So we have this correctness condition from before. And we want to solve this as an equation. We've got some unknowns here that we need to find. The unknowns in this case are the compiler, uh, which is one of the key components we're calculating, the execution function, uh, which will tell us how to execute the abstract machine, and the actual code type for the abstract machine. Previously, we only defined the type of it. As we go through the calculation, we're going to be defining new constructors for this code type. Uh, this whole calculation process is going to be performed by induction on E on our expression type. Uh, and we'll always start from this right hand side. So we'll start from eval E on top of some stack S. And we want to turn it into a form that eventually is going to look like this left hand side. We do that by starting to turn it into some form XXCS for some code C. So we'll have some code here um, executed on a stack. When we have that code, we can then uh, create a new defining equation for compile. So we'll say that compile E for whatever E we're doing in this induction case is equal to the C that we calculated from before. This new defining equation um, will then allow this uh, compiler correctness condition to be true, and it will tell us what the compiler is. And the calculation that we do to get to this point will be the proof of our compiler along the way, because it's based on the correctness. So I'll go through an example calculation now. This is going to be um, the simplest example possible in the interests of time. It's just going to be the base case for E equals val x. Uh, the other in cases are explained in a lot more detail in the paper, so I do recommend you go and read that. As I said before, we start from the right hand side. So in this case, it's eval of our e is now val x on top of some stack s. And we can simply apply the definition of eval from before. So this gives us x on top of some stack s. Now we're a little bit stuck. Um, there's nowhere obvious to go from here. But we can remember 
that our aim is to rewrite this into the form xxcs. So we need to essentially solve this equation, which will allow us to rewrite the right-hand side into the left-hand side. And we can solve this because this c is existentially quantified, we can create a new code constructor here. So we're going to call it push because as you'll see, it simply pushes a value onto the stack. Um, but the important part here is that this constructor captures all of the free variables on the right hand side. That means that this equation can then be used as a defining equation for exec. So not only are we defining this, um, this new constructor, we are also defining an equation for exec. And in this case, the push constructor simply pushes this value onto the stack. Now that we have this new definition, we can use it in our calculation. And that gives us exec push x s, which is in the form that we were looking for before. Now we can uh, create a new defining equation for compile by setting compile of valx equal to this bit of code, push x in this case, and this solves uh, this specific case. Once we do that for all of the cases, we get um, this. So we create several different code constructors. Um, each of them have types that are nice and precise, thank you, thanks to the dependent types. And then we have our compiler and our execution functions. So that is the basic overview of all the methodology. Um, obviously we skipped many steps, there are multiple other cases that we didn't cover, but the paper has all of the details. Um, and then it also introduces a simplification of this method using code continuations, which lets us get rid of all of these appends. Finally, the paper demonstrates the technique on a more complicated source language that adds exceptions. These cause non-local control flow, where the stack doesn't just grow and shrink linearly, uh, demonstrating that the technique works on more complicated examples. And again, it's all type safe. Even when exceptions are thrown, you know exactly what's going to happen to the stack. All of the Agda code, um, all of the paper is verified in Agda, and all of that code is available in the repository online, including another example calculation, uh, which shows this technique applied to the simply typed lambda calculus. Thank you very much for listening to our talk, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you go and read the paper. Enjoy the rest of your OCFP. Thank you very much.